how we began this whole thing, uh, I've, I've shown this picture a number of times that this is kind of the discipling process. How do we get to a disciple and how is one made? Well, it all begins with evangelism. So it seems weird that we're starting at, or that we're ending at the beginning rather than starting at the beginning. But I promise you there's a plan for it. I promise you that, that the Lord d- did this in great order. Um, it, it was not my intention to even bring this up, even to bring evangelism up. Um, but it's something that has kind of uh, been brought to my attention that we need to talk about a little bit. And so uh, we because I think I think the reason I didn't want to bring it up is because we have this. I guess I have this assumption that we know what evangelism is. Right. We, we just kind of know what it means to talk with the people that we know about Jesus. And so there's this assumption. And I, I think my assumption is ignorant. I think that my assumption is is uh, off course and that we we do need to recover a biblical idea of evangelism. So uh, I wanted to talk about this. This will not be, you know, a crash. This will not be a distinct, um, you know, it won't be a class, but it's going to be a crash course. It's going to be a, a 30,000 foot view of evangelism. So as we get started talking about witnessing or evangelizing somebody, um, I want you to close your eyes and think for a minute about the person who shared Christ with you. Who was that person that shared Christ with you for the very first time? Do you remember them? And think, how did it impact you then? And how is it impacting you tonight? We need to hold on to those people that first shared faith with us because we are fruit of the seed that they scattered. God has watered that seed. God has grown that seed. And that, that person is a, 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 uh, a picture to us of what it means to evangelize, right? You've been evangelized. You've been told uh, about, uh, about Christ. Thus, you have examples out there. We all have examples. So we need to hold on to them. And then we need to go a step further and we need to be them. So tonight I want to talk about sharing our faith in order that the gospel may first be heard and second believed in that order. Okay? So evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion. Euangelion, which means good news. It's the same word that uh, is, go- is gospel, the same word that we get gospel from. It means good news. And if you can imagine the word gospel in a verb form, I've got this shirt that kind of says it in verb form that I wear from time to time, but you would get something like gospeling or to gospelize, Right? That's gospel in verb form. Gospel is something. It's a, it's a noun. It is something to, to evangelize, to euangelion in verb form is to gospelize, which might be a, a little bit better understanding of what we're talking about. When we talk about evangelism, what we are talking about doing is going out and gospelizing. We're talking about going out and gospeling to somebody. Um, And really what that means is heralding, is heralding. Christ came, actually one of the better pictures for us to think about is uh, you see in the movies of the, the, uh, the Renaissance time with the the Kings and all the Royal class, right? Um, You have the, the trumpeter that would show up, you know, this class that would show up, there'd be people and the the red carpet would roll out from the carriage and that they would blow the trumpets and somebody would stand up on a box and open the scroll and read an announcement from the king. That's heralding. That's gospeling. It's taking a message that we have been given, taking the scroll, the message that we have been given, and reading it word for word, delivering it to others just as it's been delivered to us from Christ himself. 
So that's what it means to go out and to gospelize. We are heralding a message. We are delivering something that has been given to us. And it is very critical that we do this well, right? It's not a half-hearted thing. In fact, in that Renaissance time period, if it was understood that the herald of the king's court would even get one word wrong, they could be sentenced to death. Because it was very important for that herald to get the message exactly clear from the king to the people. So, likewise, it is with the greatest message that has ever been given, the greatest news that's ever been given, it is with us as well. We handle it very carefully and cautiously, yet full of assurance because we have the word of God, which tells us exactly the message we are to send. So evangelism has had many definitions over the course of the last 2,000 years, but through the scriptures we can know what it is. And one of the best ways to know what something is, is to know what it is not, right? So let's look at a few things that evangelism is not. I'll put them up on the screen for you. Evangelism is not being silent in a lifestyle evangelism uh, you know, this is the thought that, well, I just, I live on this mission. I don't have to say anything. I just do, and people understand that I'm a Christian. I just go from here to here, to day to day, just being me and doing good things, and this is evangelism. Well, this isn't evangelism. This is the call of a Christian, and this is living like a, like a Christian, but it's not evangelism. Because, let's say, let's say you're at Walmart, and uh, you walk out to the car and you've got something in your cart that you didn't pay for and you're putting the stuff in the, in the, the car, right? And you realize, hey, I didn't pay for that. So you have a dilemma, right? Do I do the right thing or do I do the wrong thing? So you do the right thing, you take it back into the store and you say, hey, I, this was in my cart, I didn't pay for it and you either pay for it now or you return it and say, I gotta go, I don't want it, you know, here, here it is. Right, you do the right thing. You take it back into the store, and you walk out uh, rather than uh, rather than just stealing it. And this is a good thing to do, and it's the right thing to do. And I think we would all agree with that. But it's not evangelism. Why? Because that that encounter did not communicate the gospel. It was a witness of uh, maybe of, of how the gospel has affected you and affected your conscience, but it is not the gospel. You, you didn't herald the gospel message. You know, Jesus does tell us to, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lampstand and put it under a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light in the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The, this is our general way of living. It's a general call to the Christian to live, uh, live in a Christian way all the time. We live differently than the world, and people understand you know, that we live differently because we're Christians, and they may even be able to see that in us. And in, in them uh, asking or, or being, you know, why do you do that? Even that person at Walmart might be, may be like, well, five other people have, done that, have taken stuff today and not said anything. And we, we watched them, right? They may be like, why are you different? And there's, there's, the, there's the opening, there's the doorway to the conversation. But this technically in and of itself and just living at your light shining before men is not technically evangelism, but it is the entryway into evangelism. More on that in a moment. The second thing that evangelism is not, it's not a statistic. We often in America, since the, the time of Charles Finney in the 19th century, we have come to treat evangelism like a statistic. Repeat a phrase after me and you can be saved. See how sterile that sounds? See how cold that is? If you want to be saved today, repeat after me. Just open this box and you can be saved. 
right? It's, it's this, this way of treating people as a statistic and not as a soul. This is not salvation. If I, this is more along the lines of co- coercion, coercion, uh, manipulation, um, getting people to say the right things and thinking then they will be saved. But the truth is that many can be manipulated into saying the right things without meaning it at all. Right? Unless they come to confess with their mouth that the reality that is set in their heart is a gospel understanding, is a salvific understanding, they're not saved. If they're just confessing words with their mouth that you've uh, manipulated them into saying, they're not saved. It's about the heart, not the behavior. Right? It's about people and souls, not statistics. So, this is the second thing that evangelism is not. Third, evangelism is not being set aside, meaning being given the title of evangelist. Um, This would be someone saying that since I have the title of evangelist, evangelist, everything I do is evangelism. Right? There's only actually one place in the scriptures that there is an, an, an official title given to someone named someone called an evangelist, and that's in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave some to be prophets, apostles, uh, pastors, shepherds, evangelists, teachers. And this, this is an understanding that there might be somebody that has a, a gifting, a quote-unquote spiritual gifting to be more ev- uh, of an evangelist than someone else, right? Someone, God may call someone into that position, but that also does not mean that everything they do or that in order to do evangelism, you have to be set apart. Right. If you look at Acts 1 verse 8 or Matthew 28, 18 through 20, those are the great commissions. You will quickly find that everyone who is a disciple is called to evangelize and not just a particular person. Right. Evangelism is not um, only done if you are set apart to evangelize. And it's actually b- almost better done when you have no title in an official capacity at all. I make a poor evangelist out on the street when people find out what I do. <laughs> when people find out that I'm a pastor. They don't want to talk about anything. They just, they just want to say the right things, so I'll leave them alone. <laughs> leave me alone. Go away. You're bothering me now. The fourth thing that evangelism is not is marketing. Um, Like I said this morning, we have brought professionalism into the church. We treat church like a business. We treat the pastor like a CEO. We treat whatever kind of board as a uh, official decision-making board like a company would. Um, You know, we've done this with evangelism in the church. We've treated evangelism like marketing. If we just had a $1,000 campaign on Facebook and people saw this trendy video that we made, or we had these pamphlets that went out, you know, then people would be saved. No, then people would come to your church. Then people would come to your church. And that's not evangelism. It's a great thing to do. You should invite people to church. You should invite people into your community. But again, this is kind of like living your life on mission and counting it as evangelism. Your church has good news. It has people that have good news. But inviting someone to church isn't necessarily you giving them the good news. It would be me giving them the good news. But you are, you are also called as people to evangelize to the people that you love and that God puts in your place. So it's, it's fine for us as pastors, for me as a pastor, to evangelize. However, this marketing campaign mentality is not evangelism. So what is evangelism? A good definition of evangelism was put forth by N.T. Niles. He said, evangelism is simply one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Put in another way, one person who knows where the source of life 
is telling somebody else where the source of life is. Right? Uh, one person who knows the living God telling somebody else where the living God is and how to get to him. One beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. Now, Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 10. Here's a great place to understand what evangelism is. Romans 10, verse 5 through 17. It says this, Moses writes about the righteous, that is, the righteousness that is based on the law. Uh, sorry, I'm going to read it from the screen. That the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the, righteous, the, the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? What does the commandment say? What does the law say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? Meaning in their heart, this is what we were just talking about. And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, meaning trained and given the authority to go, go preach? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So our witness, our, our evangelism starts in the words of Jesus. It penetrates our heart. It comes out through our confession of our mouth. And then it goes out to those who are around us. That's the process. It comes from being trained in the word, from being taught the word, from, being, um, from, from your familiarity with the word. That has to set in here. That has to set here before it can come out of here. So evangelism is indeed preaching, but this does not just mean preaching from a preacher such as a pastor. Pastors do preach, yet what Paul is talking about here in this context is not the church. He's not talking about the ordering of a church and saying pastors preach, pastors preach and do this, right? That's not what he's talking about. If you want to see what he means by preaching the word, go to First or Second Timothy. Pastors do preach, but what he's talking about here are people who are saved by grace through faith, mobilized into their communities with a word of the gospel on their tongue, ready to give it to people. It's anyone who knows the truth of the gospel and here and confesses it here and can bear witness or give the gospel to somebody else. But we come back to this gospel, right? We started with the gospel, the euangelion. We're coming back to this gospel. This is what evangelism is. It is gospelizing. Thus, here is what you need to know to do proper evangelism. You need one thing, the gospel. And I guess you need to either be able to know how to speak or to write or to sign, to communicate it somehow. You need the gospel. What tools do I need? The gospel. <laughs> the gospel. You need training in the gospel. You need to understand the gospel. You need the gospel. To do proper evangelism, you don't need a marketing campaign. You need the gospel. You need the gospel. 
But I do want to make a clarifying statement that preaching the gospel or giving the gospel is not the same thing as witnessing. I want to show you that because we talked about witnessing a couple weeks ago. We must witness. It's an important thing for disciples to know how to do is to learn how to witness. I even gave you a formula of that a couple weeks ago of how to help people develop this uh, testimony. But witnessing means to tell others who I used to be, how I met Christ, and now what I'm like after meeting him. That's witnessing. But you can do that without presenting the gospel. See the point? I was this way, I met Christ, and now I'm this way. But you didn't necessarily communicate the gospel. You communicated the fruit of the gospel, what the gospel does, the power of the gospel to change you from darkness to light, but you did not necessarily give the gospel. That's, that's why uh, witnessing is not necessarily gospelizing, but again, it's a door, just like the good works, it's a door into gospelizing. I'm not a huge fan of street witnessing. I'm not a huge fan of street preaching. I know it has its time. I know it has its place. I know it, God uses those seeds. Um, but the door that I like to, the door I like to walk through the most, I think that, that the Lord opens up the most for me, is relationships. To be able to build a relationship with someone and let that door lead to gospelizing. Build friendships with people so that you build their trust and their respect and then gospelize to them. But if you remember the picture that we had up here, witnessing and evangelizing go together because it does take, here's the gospel and then here's how it has changed me. See the proof? You know, picture A, picture B. Which one's better? You decide. All right. I want to give you a, uh, um, I want to give you a, an example of what it might sound like to share the gospel with someone. So this isn't this isn't to total. This is a sum of conversations that I've had just to give you an example. You know, especially when you've opened that door into friendship, this becomes a little easier because you can be hanging out with somebody. You can be with somebody doing something that, you, that you've done. And you can say something like this. Hey, can I share something with you without it being weird? I, I just I need to tell you something. I need to share something with you. Yeah, sure. OK, this is gonna, I'm going to ask you some questions. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready for your crazy questions. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah. Have you ever stolen something? Well, probably. Have you ever looked at someone with lust? Well, dude, duh. Like, do you know that God has a law that says all of those things are called sin? And more often than not, somebody will respond, yeah, I've heard something about that. Or I grew up in the church or, you know, I'm familiar that, that there's a, the Ten Commandments or something like that. Yeah, I've kind of heard a little bit about that. Yeah, so listen, the questions that I just asked you, man, in God's eyes, according to that law, you just admitted to me that you are a lying, stealing adulterer in the eyes of God. Man, when you put it that way. So in other words, right, you're a lawbreaker. You're a lawbreaker. And if God brought you into the courtroom to decide what to do with you, kind of like we would do in a court of law here in America, if you break the law, you go before the judge. You know, there's a fine. There's something you have to do to make restitution with that breaking of the law. If God brought you into his court, do you think, do you think, you know, put this back on them, do you think that the verdict would be guilty or not guilty? Well, by what you told me, I guess it would be guilty. All right, heaven or hell? Well, again, get based on what you told me, I guess hell, right? Okay, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. The Bible says the wages of, uh, of God, uh, the wages from God uh, for sin is death, meaning hell, meaning God will owe you, owes you justice. And his justice in that law breaking is death. But then you ask him another question. Do you know, do you know what God has done though? 
to help you pay that fine? Do you know what God has done so that if you died today, all of those laws that you broke would be paid for? Because there is in the, the American court system, you explain this to people, there is, someone can pay your fine. Someone can pay your fine for you. Do, do you know how God paid this fine for you? No, I don't, I don't know about that. Well, let me tell you. God sent his perfect son, Jesus, to die for you. Because you deserve death, well, he died for you. He shed his blood on the cross so that the sins of all the laws that you've ever broken, which I think if we would go through them are many, right? Um, he's, he's died for all of them. He's died for all of them. Because like me, you're, you're like me. We can't take care of sin on our own because the minute that we say that we're sorry, we're back at it. We're sinning again. We need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. So why I ask you all of these things, and what I wanted to share with you, my friend, is that if you confess your sins today, just as I did some 10 years ago, and, and trust that Jesus is the only payment for your sin, your sins can be forgiven right now and forever. Have you ever heard that before? Well, I've never heard that before. But I like what you're saying. So man, if, if you repent today, meaning you turn from your sins and you follow Jesus, where the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it also continues and says that uh, if you follow Christ and you repent from your sin, there is a gift waiting from God to all of those who believe, and it's eternal life in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be paid the wage for your sin because Jesus took that for you. You can have the wage of eternal life based on Christ's work and not ours. You don't have to worry about being good enough because we can never be good enough. You're my buddy. You punch him and punch him in the arm. I know you're not good enough, right? Guys understand that lingo. Girls, not so much. But I want to share that with you because I love you and I can't bear the thought of being without you in eternity. So will you think about what I shared with you? Yeah, I'll think about it. Will you promise we can talk about it if, if you have any questions? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, let's go get a cheeseburger. Right? Take five minutes with somebody. Take five minutes out of a car ride. Take five minutes out of a conversation something with somebody to give them these things. But those things that I shared can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The essentials of the gospel are there in the very first chapters, or the very first verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So this is sharing the gospel with somebody. This is what evangelism is. It is giving the good news, whether it be in written form or in vocal form or signing to somebody. Uh, everything else that we do, the witnessing, the, the uh, good works, all of those things are open doors. But evangelism is strictly euangelion. It's gospelizing. It's giving the gospel and the good news. So pray. Pray for opportunities to share with someone that good news. Now, as promised, I do want to talk with you uh, a little bit about how we can engage with the Muslim community or maybe what you need to engage with the Muslim community, what you need to understand, some of the basics um, about what they believe and the contrast of what we believe. I do have a take-home sheet for you, so remind me to give that to you of some tips and, and things that Answers in Genesis actually put out um, for cultural mistakes that we can make when sharing the gospel with, with someone of the Islamic faith and truths that we need to ingrain in ourselves and take hold of. Now, I've shared with atheists, I've shared with Mormons, I've shared with, with people that are you know, agnostic, but I've never had the opportunity to share with Muslims. I've had the desire, um, I've had the, the uh, opportunity to read literature and you know, do all the studying and the things like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm passing on to you what I know, right? I'm, I'm passing on to you what I know but it, from what I've been told, I actually have a, uh, um, 
I have a professor that has two doctorate degrees in Muslim studies. Um, uh, he's not my professor, but he's my friend. He was my elder at one point in time. He is a professor. Um, and, and something that I've heard from him and something that I've heard from, from uh, actually a, a missionary that I met with from, uh, oh, help me out. What's the country that he's from? Not Romania. Nope. Between them, between Ukraine and Romania. Moldova, yes, he's from Moldova, and he is a, a leader of the church in all the Istan countries in Central Asia, okay? And uh, he, he told me just recently and kind of helped me remember what my professor friend had said, that it's actually easier to talk to a Muslim than an atheist because they, are, they know what they believe, and they have great and high respect for religion, Actually, they probably treat their Bible and their religion with greater respect than you do. So it's, it's easier to talk with them. And actually in the Middle East, it, uh, maybe not right now so much, but uh, before this, it, it is said that it was easier to talk about your faith and to witness over there than in America because they're actually far more tolerant of your faith than here in America. Which just blows my mind, which is crazy. But many, many Americans and Westerners have a fear of Muslims, but we don't need to have a fear of them. We don't need to cast prejudice on people because of skin color or the way that they dress or how long their beards are or are not and the, the, or the religion that they ascribe to. In fact, it's quite sad because when you start having these conversations, you understand that the Muslim religion, the Islam, uh, their faith is very sterile and strict. And they, they have very few freedom, freedoms and joys in their life. Many testimonies of Muslims converting to Christianity uh, comes from an understanding that God is, that our God is a God of love and that he demonstrates his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, because their God is, uh, they are the, the, the pictures that we have in our minds of what it means to have Muslim leadership is exactly the picture of what they have in their minds of what God is. He's a mean, evil dictator that just casts down these orders and expects you to, to do it or else he's going to kill you. In fact, Islam literally trans translated means submission. Islam means submission. Submission. Yeah. Um, yeah. Islam is the religion. Muslims or yeah, Muslims are, are the those who follow Islam. So like, you know, Christianity, we are Christians. Islam is the religion. Muslims are the people that follow that religion. Islam means submission and Muslim means one who submits to Allah. Okay? So, just some subtle things, if you think about that, just some subtle things that may come back to your memory later um, of, yeah, of just how all of this, this can impact as we show them grace and we show them love. You know, it's something they've probably never had in their life. I might answer your question. So let me work through this. I'm going to open it up. If you have, if you have a question, I'm going to, I'm going to have them at the end. But I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a lot of information, so I might answer your question. Okay. Um, um, just some basics here. They agree, especially with the Torah, which is our first five books of the Bible. Um, so they have the same creation story, similar creation story. Um, and they will agree with that to the major points. Except their God is named Allah, and it's really just how you say God in Aramaic. They believe we're talking about the same God. I had an encounter with a guy on, the, on a plane, and uh, he said, you know, do you, what God do you serve? And I said, I serve the Creator God, Yahweh. He said, I've never heard of that God. Allah means God, Yahweh means God. But we have different understandings of what, of who that God is. It's all going to come down to, it's kind of like I said uh, a couple weeks ago, everybody loves Jesus, everybody, every, everybody loves Jesus until you start to define him. Everybody has a God, 
And they're okay with you having a God until you start to define him. So we're going to define Allah here in just a little bit. Um, where the religion of Islam began was, uh, it became official in the Middle East in the 7th century AD. A prophet named Muhammad was visited by the, it was supposedly visited by the angel Gabriel and was revealed the words of the Quran, which the Quran is a book, it's an extra, extra biblical book that, uh, meaning outside of the Bible, right? It's outside of the Bible, which is 114 chapters of religious text that they believe to be infallible and the final revelation of God. Right? We believe John's revelation to be the final closing of canon. Right? And if you have questions about canon, we can talk about that at another time. But we believe that God's final revelation, God's final words given to the church for uh, an apostle to write down was the book of Revelation. Well, they've opened this back up to say that an angel visited and gave them the words of the Quran which is almost the same story that Joseph Smith has about the angel delivering the two golden tablets that had the Book of Mormon on it. The scriptures do say that angels, that the devil can appear to you as an angel of light. So you have to decide for yourself. Now Paul says, you know, even if an angel comes to you presenting another gospel, don't believe it. Believe the one gospel, believe the true gospel, that is the gospel that you have been delivered from us. But angels do go around heralding gospels, whether they be uh, not, not the angels that, we, um, that serve our creator, but if you catch my drift, demons, the angels of darkness, right? They want to confuse you, and they want to give you extra biblical things, just like the devil did in the garden. The Quran basically is a commentary on biblical, the biblical text, and it's an instruction book for a uh, Islamic, a Muslim life. And so commentary means that you can find things like this. Uh, the Quran also teaches that their God, Allah, inspired sin into humankind. And here's the texts of where you can, in the Quran, where you can find that. They believe that humans are sinners because Allah has willed it. So, not that man chose to deliberately disobey God's word, but that God, their God, injected sin into the world, caused that person, wrote it on their heart, they're going to sin. Today, on this day, God wrote it down, they're sinning today, which means he is the author of sin, which means he can sin. So is that a good God? Is that a holy God? No, it's a fallible God. It's an evil God. It means that God can cause someone to sin, which is evil. It's inciting evil. And our God, the creator God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the scriptures, Jesus' father, Jesus himself, God the Son, is holy and will never do this. So I've got a couple of things that I want to share with you. And if you want to take pictures of these, I think that's helpful. Um, you can also go look them up because Islam is a very prominent religion in our world. Um, but here are six, here's their six articles of faith. Here's their doctrine, okay? Here's their doctrine. Six things. The first is that they believe in one Allah. Muslims believe that Allah is one. He is the eternal creator and sovereign. He's not three in one, he's just one. There is one God in heaven. Right? And he's not three. He's not revealed through word and spirit. And uh, as, the, as the father, he is just Allah. The second thing they believe is they believe in angels. And, and this is their understanding, which is actually helpful in our witnessing to them, that they believe in the supernatural. Right? They do believe in the supernatural, which is, you know, more than atheists can say. Third, belief, they, believe, they believe in prophets. Prophets include biblical prophets, 
uh, but end with Muhammad as Allah's final prophet. They believe, and I think I'm going to get in this, that Jesus was a prophet, but he was not the prophet to end all, be all. Muhammad was the end all, be all prophet. Muhammad was a better prophet, which is just crazy to me. Um, I guess as, a, as you study the life of Muhammad and you study the life of Christ, how can you say, that's neither here nor there. That's not what this is about. Um, they believe in prophets, so that's, that's also helpful. They believe a lot of the prophetic text and the scriptures. They believe, fourth, they believe in the revelations of Allah. So Muslims accept certain portions of the Bible. I've already said they accept the Torah. And strangely enough, they accept most of the Gospels. They accept most of the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, the life of Christ. They believe that the Quran is the pre-existent, perfect word of Allah, though. It came from God, always has been. This is a part of their God, right? The Quran. It's the perfect word of Allah that was delivered to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel in the 7th century. Fifth, they believe in a last day of judgment and the hereafter, meaning they believe in an afterlife. So everyone will be resurrected to a judgment into either a paradise or hell. They believe that Muhammad will come back and lead them all to hell where God will then judge the people. And that judgment is not based on any law. It's based on him, what he believes to be right. You're, Hold on to that. That's important. The sixth thing that they believe is in predestination. Muslims believe that Allah has decreed everything that will happen. Muslims testify to Allah's sovereignty with their frequent phrase, inshallah, meaning if God wills. So you can see even in these six doctrines, Christianity, the greatest lies always have hints of truth. Actually, the greatest lies always have more truth and just hints and perversions of the truth. Can you see the perversion of the truth mixed with a lot of truth? These are their doctrines. Now, I want to look at, I want to give you also their five pillars. What all denominations, there are three denominations of Muslims um, some more radical than others, but they all believe these five pillars. They all believe, they all ascribe to these five pillars. The first, uh, the first is, and this is even their, doc, their covenant statement, if you want to become a Muslim, you agree to follow these five things. And in fact, this is how you will be judged. The testimony of faith, the shahada, now, I can't pronounce this, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it, but the La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasul Allah, then it means there is no deity but Allah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is their testimony of faith. This is what they confess with their mouth. What do we confess with our mouth? First John says that Christ is Lord. They believe that there is no deity but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So a person can con convert to Islam by stating this creed, and it does reveal that Muhammad is their one, or that Allah is their one deity, and that they follow. They pin, pin a lot of their faith on one human. He was a prophet. He was not God. He was a human, right? So their second one is prayer. The Salat, five ritual prayers must be performed every day. Um, you can see videos of this. You can see people doing it in the protests around the world right now. They believe in giving, the zakat. This almsgiving is a certain percentage given once a year. Fasting, the swam, which Muslims fast during Ramadan in the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, and they must not drink, must not eat or drink from dawn until sunset. Pilgrimage, I believe it is Hajj. If physically and financially possible, a Muslim must make the pilgrimage to Mecca in Saudi Arabia at least once in their lifetime. So, as I said, I, I still stand on what I said. There, there is no law that you're judged by at the end of time. 
But you do have these five pillars that you must follow or because they're what you're going to be judged by. Those are two contradicting statements, but they are definitely in the Islamic faith because this is what they agree to. This, their entrance into paradise hinges on obedience to these five pillars, but still Allah may reject them. Why? Because even Muhammad, the perfect prophet, the one that was better than Jesus, was not even sure whether Allah would admit him into paradise or not. So you must follow, follow these five things. This is how you're going to get into paradise. But it may not work. There's no assurance of faith in the Islam religion. That's why everyone lives in fear. The Islamic religion lives in fear. The, the Muslim people live in fear of Allah. So I ask you, is there assurance of faith in Christ? Absolutely there is. He who is in Christ is sealed, as Ephesians 1 says. He who is in Christ is a good work that God has begun, Philippians 1, chap, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. He is a good work that God has begun and will see it through to completion. We can have great assurance that if we are saved through the words of Scripture, we can have great assurance through the words of Scripture that we have salvation in Christ and by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and by the fruit seen in our lives that comes from the vine of Christ. We have plenty of assurance written in the Scriptures about assurance of our faith. But the Islam religion, the Muslims have fear because there is no assurance. Maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. And it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, that's kind of what the Catholic faith is right is too. Like, you may, you may not. Christian, Christianity, following Christ, Christ in, in the scriptures, is the only is the, the well, is the only religion that says you have assurance that you're going to be saved. Hinduism, who knows? You may come back as a fly, a cow, a, you know, this person, that person, who knows? Mormonism, the cults, they're the same way. You may be good enough, you may not be good enough, who knows? What do they believe about Jesus. Well, they believe that he was a prophet. They believe he was a very important prophet. They also believe the, the testimony that he was virgin born, which just, again, blows my mind. But he was not God. He was not God. He was not Allah. There's one Allah. He was not God. Not only that, he did not die on a cross. They do not believe that he died on a cross. Which, again, is perplexing because the Gospels all tell about Christ's death on the cross. Well, they admit that part because they don't believe that he died at all. They believe that it was made to look like he died on the cross, but that he didn't die. God took him up to heaven without having to die at all. It was kind of like being whisked away like, uh, like Elijah in the chariots of fire. It was made to look like that he died on the cross. And actually, if you, you go into this academically, uh, there's called the, the, the history or the proven facts of the resurrection. There's a lot of atheists that agree on certain facts of the resurrection or of, of the death of Christ and that he died on the cross is definitely one that they agree on. The resurrection is not one. Right. But there are there are facts that are agreed in academia between Christian and atheists and agnostics. And it's without a doubt proven that Christ was killed on a cross and he was dead. So that's what they believe about Christ. He didn't die at all. He wasn't God. Um, he was not a savior. He was a prophet. Okay, now, I want to give you three ways as we close. I want to give you three ways to prepare yourself to be able to witness to Muslims or to teach our children and grandchildren to witness to Muslims as well. The first one is this. Be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's inside of you. That's first and foremost with any religion. 
with any person. Be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's inside of you. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16 says, but in your hearts honor Christ as Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet do it with gentleness. I don't have it up there. With gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ, they may be put to shame. Not you. You be gentle. You be respectful. You have a good conscience. But be prepared. My friends, we, we, if we don't know what we believe, we will have a hard time sharing that. <laughs> it makes no sense. You can't share what you don't know. You can't share what you don't know. Thus, the fear in the church is, well, I don't know what I would say. I don't know how to witness to somebody. I've never done it. Uh, what do I say? What do I do? You tell them what you know. And the fear comes from you don't know a lot. You've never been pushed to prepare yourself. You've never been pushed to train. You've never been pushed to give an answer for the hope that's inside of you. Thus, we as Christians are trying to always be ready, growing and maturing in our faith, ready to defend it, ready to explain it to anyone who asks. Maybe not perfectly. Who cares about perfectly? Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will speak for you when questioned. So practice this. Let me admonish you. Practice this at home with your spouse. Practice this with a friend. Practice this with your children. Practice writing it out and presenting the gospel. Practice speaking what gives you hope. Because you can't put it to use if you haven't practiced it. You can't get better at it if you don't practice it. So if you don't have assurance of your faith and a strong conviction of your hope, my question is, how will you help someone else come to have assurance of salvation, an assurance of faith, and a hope for the future? Therefore, be prepared. I think there's a Disney song about that. Be prepared, be prepared, be prepared to give an answer for the hope inside of you. Secondly, understand the reliability of the scriptures and the ability to know God. That's important. You can know God. Hinduism, you can't know him or them. Buddhism, you can't know him. Islam, you can't know him. The Quran says that. You can't know God. He knows you, but you can't know him. He's impersonal. Understand the reliability of the scriptures and the ability to know God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God, so you can know him. And it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you have a man of God, it presupposes you know what God is like. Tracking? To have a man of God, a complete man of God, trained, presupposes that you can know what God is like. The Word of God is complete. It tells of who God is. You can know Him so that you can imitate Him. Many Muslims believe that the Bible is corrupt. They do not believe that they can know God or know absolute truth the way that Allah does. But they neglect their own Quran in saying that because the Quran also teaches that the Bible, the first five books, and the Gospels can be trusted. So which is it? Can the Bible be trusted or can't it? And then it goes on to make comment about those scriptures and give extra meaning to it. So if you can give comment to those scriptures, it seems like you have extra knowledge of knowing what's true and what's not true. So what's, can I know truth or can't I? Well, you can't even know that you're saved or not. You can't, you can't know. You just can't. It's, a, it's chaos. Guys, when you look at other religions, it's either Christ or chaos. When you look at the world, you're either acting like Christ or you're acting like chaos. It's either Christ or chaos. And all the relig religions that deny Christ are chaotic religions. You never know what a God may or may not do. The Greek pantheon, oh my goodness, can you imagine? 
What's a, what's a God going to be up to today? Well, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. So it's important for us as Christians to know this is how we live. We trust the scriptures. We trust the word of God. We are pursuing a relationship to know God. So have you experienced the faithfulness of God through his word? And have you come to know the living, breathing God himself? Understanding these things will prove to be your greatest witness in any religion because all of them intersect with the scriptures. They all have ideas on the scriptures. Third, you need to come to an understanding so that you can emphasize the love of God and the work of Christ on the cross, which gives us our righteousness rather than our work. Every other religion, I haven't found one yet. If you know of one, help me out. Every other religion in this world, other than Protestant Christian religion, is a works-based religion. Every religion, other than Protestant biblical Christianity, is a works-based faith. You can do things to add to your salvation or take away from your salvation. But in Christianity, the work of our salvation was done on the cross. You can't add to your salvation. In Christianity, if you deny the work of Christ on the cross, you don't have salvation. Right? It's not about what you can do. It's not about the prayers you can pray or all the things that you, know, you might do or may not do. Romans 5, uh, 6 through 11 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now, have, we now receive reconciliation." Our salvation is not built on works that we have done or can do. Go back to me punching my friend in the arm. I know you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. The work that is done for our salvation is done through the man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And through his death, his atoning death, through his resurrection from the dead which defeated death and satisfied the wrath of God. That is our righteousness. That is our work of righteousness. It's not in us. It's a gift given to us. Our hope is built on the love of a personal creator who wants to have a relationship with us so much that he sent a way for us to get to him. We don't deserve the credit. We don't deserve the honor. We are beggars. We've come full circle. We are beggars that have been given far more bread than we deserve. And we humbly and simply and lovingly want to show others where to find it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, that we can know you. Thank you for, for loving us, for giving us power through the cross and the resurrection of your son. Thank you for loving us while we were still sinners. Help us, Father, to love others while they're still sinners and to show them the love that Christ has had for them. I pray, Father, you'd give us opportunities as your people to witness to those who are in our community who need the love of Christ, who need, who need the, the grace and the mercy of Christ and the assurance of faith in Jesus rather than of their works. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.